We are now going to move slightly to something different, but something that is central to research excellence, and that is research management. Um, our CAPREX initiative, which is funded by Carnegie Corporation of New York, has supported capacity building of research managers in our African partner universities. And a few years ago, a team of uh, Cambridge-based uh, uh, administrators from the Research Operations Office designed and provided research management training workshops in collaboration with partner universities. We will first hear from Mrs. Afwa Yeboa, who is Senior Assistant Registrar in charge of grant management at the University of Ghana and a beneficiary of the research management training workshop. She will be joined by Debbie West Lewis, who is the training manager at the Research Operations Office here at the University of Cambridge. Debbie will tell us more about this research collaboration. I'm not Afro. I'm Debbie West Lewis. Um, as, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm not going to take up too much of Afra's time because she really does have some incredibly important things to tell you. Um, but I do want to thank Professor David Dunn, Professor James Wood, Dr. Pauline Essa, the Carnegie Corporation, and my office, the Research Operations Office, because without their sterling support, this event, and Jenny Mackay, <laughs> uh, without their sterling support, just seeing you, sorry, um, this event could never, ever have taken place. It has been a true privilege and an honor to be able to guide them, to help them, and to support them on their journey, both the University of Ghana and my career. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, Debbie. And thank you for inviting me to um, this program. It's a delight and an honor to be here to speak about research management. The University of Ghana has been on a journey and is still on that journey to attain research excellence. And um, one of the things that the university realized very early on in the journey was if you want to build research capacity, if you want to encourage research, I mean, doing, getting scientists to do fantastic research is fine, but you need to provide support to the scientists to enable them do what they want to do. You don't want your scientists running around doing things that um, really could be done by people trained um, to provide support. So I'll speak about the University of Ghana, then our vision and strategy, and then research management at the University of Ghana, just put it into context so that we know where we've come from and where we are today, and then a few conclusions. So about the University of Ghana, um, in the morning, one of my colleagues spoke about the investigation. I can get an overview of the University of Ghana, but um, we're the oldest and largest public university um, in Ghana today, and um, we ranked in 2016 seventh best university um, in Africa. Our vision um, is to become a world-class research intensive <coughs> investor over the next decade, and this is so important because um, this vision was crafted from our strategic plan in 2014. Um, our then Vice Chancellor Prof. Ernest IETA led the process of developing um, a new strategic plan and direction for the University of Ghana. And prior to this, prior to 2010, the vision was focused a lot on teaching and learning. Research did not really, um, um, was not really highlighted in that strategic plan. And um, you see that our mission and our strategy, everything well, it revolves around research today because we recognize the impact that research makes. If we want to be relevant, if we want to um, make, uh, pro produce the quality of materials that we talk about, saying we want high quality students, we need to ensure that our research is of high quality. And this our strategy um, has been to ensure integrity, commitment, respect, and loyalty. Interestingly, um, when we did our strategic plan, we have nine strategic um, objectives, and research was the first objective that the university outlined. So putting it into context, um, our office, the Office of Research, Innovation, and Development, was established in 2010. 
So this does not mean that before 2010, there was no research management going on. So between 2007 and 2010, um, we, had, we have a school of graduate studies and the research administration and management fact, functions were under the school of graduate studies. So it was then called the school of research and graduate studies. And what basically um, we did at the time was to um, serve as a research and conferences committee. Our mandate and our spread, our breadth of services was quite limited. Um, one, because of the institutional structures at the time. In 2007, um, I, I, the university itself realized that we needed to do introspection. And we set up a panel um, of eminent professors and industry leaders, both in Ghana, from Ghana and outside. And one of the key recommendations that they made was that if the university wants to move forward and to become relevant to the next decade, that we need to take our research serious. We need to better organize our research. We need to have a central place, a central office that coordinates the research. And so that's how the idea of having a separate research office, um, that's how it was built. And by 2008, the university itself decided, look, if we are talking about research and we want to be relevant, we want, we talk up, we tell, keep telling our faculty members, oh, you need to do research, you need to discover things. We ourselves need to show that um, we are committed to the process. We are committed to providing them funding. And by 2009, the recommendations from the vestation report has started being implemented so that by 2010, we're ready to take off. And a lot has happened um, since we started. So the question that we kept asking, why do we need to do research management? Is it not just enough to tell faculty members to do research? We needed to enhance our faculty research output. We needed to increase our visibility and our profile. We need to tell people what we are able and capable of doing. We needed to ensure that there was transparency and then the donors had confidence in us. And then we needed really, and I'm sure this is basic, that research funds need to be utilized for the purpose for which they were awarded. Because you see, when you don't have an office that manages and coordinates research, you have pockets of excellence and you have lots of things that are not done in a coordinated fashion. That does not tell a good story. And for us, it was important that we demonstrate our commitment and our, and our, our willingness to do the right thing. And so um, our journey from 2010 to date has been, um, well, in 2010, we established the office. And in 2011, we started develop the development of policies and guidelines for research because one of the things I recognized was that if you want people to do research, you want everyone to you know, do the things the way the investor expects, then you need to make sure you have the policy, you have the guidelines, you have rules and regulations that people would follow because there's no point holding someone to ransom when you've not provided them the direction. And so that's um, one of the things that um, we set out to do. By 2012, our uh, services had expanded, and so we needed to recruit officers that were responsible for driving research. And at the University of Ghana, we call them the research development officers. So we recruited our first cohort of research development officers. At this time, the Cambridge Research Office also um, came as part of the CAPREX program to do a scope and visit. We, and then we, we were preparing for the CAPREX program, so everything sort of fed into internalized. And after we started our research management visits to the University of Cambridge, we then had the capacity to do other things, to provide support for proposal development, for instance, to um, help in contract management and negotiation. And in 2014, um, we had grown to the extent that we had now started engaging directly with industry. So we started intellectual property technology transfer and other things. And in 2017, just last year, we decided to restructure um, our services because we've grown and we need to be able to service the investee in a way that is efficient and in a way that um, makes everybody happy and that we're able to make a lot of impact. So what are our building blocks? These are things that we thought about and felt we need to first of all, get buy-in from the investing community. Mind you, the investee was established in 1948. We have institutes, centers, departments that have been doing research, and there's never been a research office. And they're, they're fine. I mean, if you ask them, so we're fine. We're fine without a research office. So how do you demonstrate that even though you are older than us, this office is, has been established to coordinate and make your life easier. We needed to get that buy-in. These are some of the things that we focused on in our um, first couple of years. 
So some of the things that we do, um, pre and post award service, and these are just examples of some of the things that we do at the University of Ghana today. Um, right from finance and plating fund opportunities down to ethical clearance and technology transfer and so many other things, administration scholarships and other um, internal grant and funds. So our approaches and strategies. So I mentioned that we recruited um, research development officers. We started with 12. Today we have 27 research development officers because our services have grown. We needed to be able to provide um, a high quality and efficient service. We wanted to do things that were easy to do, like increasing our visibility on the website. Because you see, if a donor um, wanted to contact you, or wanted to find out what sort of work you were doing, maybe they may not know who at the University of Ghana to talk to. But if they went on our website, they will find the information and know some of the things that we've done and what we are capable of doing. So that if they gave us funds, they are sure that we'll be able to use it well, manage it well. So those were, that's one of the critical things that we picked on. And um, consistent training of frontline staff, and also ensuring fairness, transparency, and integrity in the administration of research. And this is so important because I, um, most African institutions, there's a perception that um, we are not transparent enough. There's not a lot of fairness. And it's important, to, if you want to grow your research, to demonstrate that the processes are fair. Let everyone understand what their processes are. Let everyone see um, what is what they need to do and what they get. And this has helped us. So our collaboration with the University of Cambridge, in, in, interestingly, in 2010, our first visit, when we were setting up the office in 2010, two of us um, who were supposed to start the research office came to the University of Cambridge. Um, I remember Prof. James Wood at the time, at the time invited us to his department um, and we spent a week with the department and with um, the central research office. And that was the foundation because really we were, we had been operating as a school of research and graduate studies and we're being pulled out and to set, to start a, a new office, a research office. And we needed to understand um, what went into it. So that's, you know, that's where we started thinking about some of the things that we are required to do. And 20, between 2013 and 2015, as a result of um, the Cambridge link to the CAPREX program, we, we, um, we got um, Cambridge Research Office, came to University of Ghana, did a scope invested. The way we, are, we were given seven research management fellowships by the time the um, CAPREX one ended. Seven research management fellowships had been awarded. We had research management workshops. And we did a number of things that um, sort of set us up to, to be able to provide the service that we need to. So these are just some photos from some of the things that we've done under the CAPREX program, workshops, um, and then our time at the Cambridge Research Office, and also um, at one of our AGMs, the um, university management met with um, the leaders of the um, CAPREX program. So today, achievements and progress made, tracking of faculty research publications. Um, we've seen an increase in our research funding, and we've seen an increase in our international collaboration. This morning when um, speakers from University of Ghana, where I'm sure we all saw some of the collaborations and some of the um, grants that they have won, you know, um, through the Cambridge link. There's been a lot, and not only north-south, but south-south as well. We have um, collaboration with other African institutions. And this graph basically shows our research income from 2010. You see how it's grown. Um, once the university decided to start driving its research and placing emphasis on it, um, the top line, the blue line is our local currency, the Ghana CDs, and then the red line is in US dollars because we had to standardize this. Um, the gap you see is as a result of foreign exchange fluctuations, and that's one of the challenges of being an African institution. You can get so much money, but I mean, we have to buy reagents, we have to buy um, equipment, we, we import them. We don't make them in, in, in our part of the world, and you buy these things in a foreign currency, and so you may be making so much money, but in actual fact, um, the, the, the amount or what you're able to use it for may be limited. But again, uh, it's, it's showing a, a gradual increase, and this is as a result of increasing the number um, of grants. So this is um, a grant agreement. So from where we started from, um, people or faculty members would get their grants, sit in their departments, 
and um, sign grant agreements. No one would know about them until there was a problem. Um, maybe we had to, a problem which would require the investor to refund some money, then you hear about um, the grant agreements. And so we needed to put in place a system to encourage people to route their applications and their grant agreements through our way. The investee has a signing, a signature matrix, so we knew we know who is to sign what agreements and what types of agreements. But um, from 2015, over the last three years, there's been a marked increase. I mean, we are, 27, we are in the 2017-2018 academic year. It's, we are, the academic, academic year ends in July, in July 31st, and we are already almost, you know, we have 41 agreements that we've already reviewed and signed. And we are able to do this because of the training that we got through the CAPREX program, through the Research Management <laughs> Fellowships, because one of the things that um, we, we received a lot of training on was on contract management, reviewing of contracts and, and agreements, and it's been so useful in the fact that not all of us grant managers are able to look at a contract and pick out um, the terms and negotiate on it. It ha has been very useful. And so that when people approach us and say they have a grant, with, and what should they do, we know what to tell them. And it it's also has an impact on the um, research income they invest in. So this is on publications. Remember I said that there's been an impact on publications. If you look at the 10-year period between 2000 and 2010, um, we had, this is from Scopus, we had 1,000, 1,000, about 1,500 um, publications in Scopus. Over the next five years, between 2010 and 2015, it was 2,700 publications. Today, between 2016 and 2017, we did um, just two years, we've done 1,600. So I mean, we can project that even if we, if we project for the next five years, we're going to have a lot more. And this, this is what we're talking about, about visibility and about credibility, that um, we need to demonstrate what we are capable of doing. We need, to, we need to allow our faculty members to spend time doing their research, to spend time doing um, all the fantastic work. So what are some of the things that we need to consider? We've, we talked about um, but get investee buying. But one of the things that we, we thought as an investee was we need to understand the need and we need to identify what areas of support that is required. In 2007 and 2008, in the, in the, before the office was set up, the focus was on training faculty, you know, to grant rights and how do you write a proposal to win funds. That was what the focus was on. But when we started the office, we realized the needs started changing. So, you know, the ability to be able to evolve and change and meet the need is so important to ensuring that you have a research management support system that um, is capable of, you know, meeting needs. Then understanding institutional context and structure. Um, one of the things that we set out to do was not to create a totally different structure you know, for the research management office to run, but it should fit within existing structure, existing institutional structures, and this is important. If you want buying, if you want the leadership to get involved, you don't need to create something totally different. It needs to fit, fit in it. And then the human resource cap capacity and capability, RDOs, the other research support staff, who do they understand the role that they play, the importance of the role? And then the building the needed structures and outlining processes um, have been so important and critical to our success um, as a research office. Today we are structured into six teams. We started where we had research development officers in the various um, colleges and schools. Today we've sort of regrouped, we've re-centralized in, in six teams. And this basically shows how much we've grown. When we started it was just pre and post award services. And even then, we were not able to do a lot of pre award services. So they were able to provide that and provide additional um, services. Major changes, I mentioned we've recruited more people, so we are re-centralizing. Basically, what we want to do, what we are saying today is that when you come to a research office, it's a one-stop place. You should be able to get everything that you need. You should be able to get someone to support you, to help you. And the enforcing policies and guidelines. We've had the institutional signing authority matrix since 2015, but no one enforced it. So um, about a month or two ago, the investing council decided to enforce it. It sent um, correspondence around saying this is the institutional signing matrix that everyone needs to abide with by. 
and then streamlining registration with external bonus. It may not mean much to, I mean, if you're from um, a, a research office in a developed can develop investing like in um, Cambridge Invest, but at the University of Ghana, where we, we set up a research office that came after people were already doing research, you find out that if you want to apply to a donor, for instance, National Institutes of Health, someone has already registered their details there as the University of Ghana. How do you, you know, take back ownership? These are some of the things that we've had to deal with. And then indirect costs, the perception about when you charge indirects, where does the money go to? Who uses the money? You know, all these things are questions that we've had to answer and we've had to sort of find our way around it. Today we have a, a, a distribution policy. So if you do your budget, there's an indirect cost. There's an amount when we when we get the, we um, deduct the indirect cost. There's an amount that goes to um, the college. There's an amount that goes to the school. There's an amount that goes to the um, PI. And just to touch on some of the challenges: institutional culture, rules and regulations, resource limitations. We don't have. Um, you know, so much money, so much time. You know, there's so many things that need to be done within a short space of time. Conclusions. Um, these are questions that we keep asking ourselves each day um, as an office. How do we get the researcher to work with us? How do we get them to trust us? You know, that we are not there to sort of sabotage their work. And every researcher, I'm sure, will identify with this because sometimes, things become a bit bureaucratic and uh, researchers feel like we are sort of hampering their progress. But that's not what the research office aims to do. The research office wants to build trust. And some of the things that we've learned um, is that we have to demonstrate our institution's commitment to the process, put systems in place, um, deliver professional services. It's a client-based service and we need to be able to be professional at all times. And deliver to meet inter acceptable international standards. I'm thankful to Prof. Intia Mwabedu. Um, she was our foundational pro vice chancellor for the office. Um, in, in fact, her vision is what drove the office. When we started, it was just four of us. And um, through her, we're able to you know, start small and you know, build on it little by little. She's been so instrumental in our success. And our current pro vice chancellor, who sees beyond um, what we all see and is able to sort of um, steer us in the right direction. And then um, Debbie, thank you so much. Um, she's been not just a mentor, but a friend as well. Um, she's the person that we can go to when um, we're, we're sort of not in a space where we don't know what to do. And then Pauline, um, David, and James, thank you so, so, so much. Um, they, their interest in the University of Ghana is amazing. Um, there was a time that we were trying to convince Pauline to join us at the University of Ghana because she's so engaged. And, and James and David, thank you so much. And also the coordinators and managers of the CAPREX program, the Cambridge Africa program. You make it look so easy, but I know um, that there are so many things that go on behind the scene that uh, makes all this come together. Thank you.